Hey everybody, welcome to Mammoth Interactive's YouTube channel. First of all, I want to thank you for watching this video. And remember that this channel doesn't do Patreon, instead we sell our digital courses down below. And every single dollar that we get from the products you buy below goes into making more content. The best way to help out this channel and Mammoth Interactive is to subscribe to Mammoth Interactive's huge library of content. Get thousands of hours and hundreds of courses for a low, low price down below. We have a monthly option and a yearly option. Thanks for listening and I'll see you in the video. Hello everyone and welcome to Mammoth Interactive's complete machine learning course 2.0. In this course we are beginning to build supervised neural networks. Before we jump into our projects let's go over exactly what we will learn in this course and let's talk about why supervised learning and supervised neural networks are so useful in the first place. Let's start off by jumping into the applications of supervised learning. Let's talk about why we want to learn this type of task in the first place. Well, there are many, many applications of supervised learning. Let's go over some of them now. One application is for assessing loans and risk. For example, you can use supervised learning to determine whether or not there's a high chance of an applicant paying back a loan. And in fact, many companies like banks already use supervised learning to make assessments on you and me. Another example of supervised learning in action is to predict prices. Yes, you can predict, for example, the price of a real estate item such as a house based on its previous prices over years. Another application of supervised learning is stock prediction. You can predict the price of a stock by looking at its recent trends. And in fact, supervised learning is used for stock prediction currently. Another use of supervised learning and why we're going to learn it is spam detection. That's right, many companies like Gmail, they use machine learning models to detect spam. And they do this by finding words that commonly show up in spam messages like free or you won in order to mark an email as spam, saving you and me tons of time from deleting those emails ourselves. Another application of supervised learning is speech recognition. That's right, you can speak into a microphone and then get the text immediately typed out for you. And that is thanks to supervised learning. As you can see already, we are not even halfway through all the applications and there are so many applications of supervised learning. That's why this course is very exciting because we're going to learn a very powerful tool. Another example is image classification. You can use supervised learning to tag images and label them. In fact, that is the main priority we are going to be focusing on in this course, we're going to be building some projects for image classification. You may have heard the term computer vision at one point, and that refers to image classification. Image classification is one part of computer vision, which means teaching computers how to see. And by that, I mean teaching computers how to recognize images, videos, webcams, and more. Let's talk about some more applications of supervised learning and why it's so important to know. Another application is landform classification. That's right, satellites already use supervised learning to detect what is down there in the imagery of the land. What landform is that? Is that a farm, prairie? You get the idea. It has a very important task commonly used by you know, the government, military, space agencies, and they use machine learning. As you can see, machine learning has applications in very high level operations. That's why it's an extremely useful and in-demand skill. Machine learning is still at the frontier, so few people relatively to a field like biology or physics, few people are experts in machine learning or even know the basics, which we'll be covering in this course. That's why it's such an exciting field because you can really be the next Einstein in machine learning. Whereas in physics, there's already an Einstein. 
Another application of supervised learning, which I've already mentioned, is computer vision, teaching computers how to see. Yet another application is personalized marketing. Machine learning is very commonly used in business. These days, it really helps a business get an edge because you can make a customer profile for all your customers and then segment them. In fact, Facebook already does this. It makes customer profiles on everyone, you and me, if you have a Facebook account. It's going to make a profile for you based on what you've clicked on, what you've liked, what you've posted, who your friends are. It'll make a profile for you behind the scenes. And in that way, it knows how to target you with the proper ads. Now, if you're a customer, this may seem a bit daunting, but if you're a business owner, then this is quite powerful because now you know that you can give customers relevant information, relevant articles, relevant ads. That's why machine learning helps businesses save millions of dollars constantly. Another application of supervised learning is to understand biological data. Yes, it's not just about surveillance and making money. There are applications in medicine and biology as well with supervised learning. It can help discover new medicines as well as to make sense of huge amounts of research data such as you know data collected via computers or via technology. It's hard for a human, even a small team or a large team to go through all that data, but a computer can go through data very, very quickly, especially, especially relative to the human capabilities. That's why supervised learning and machine learning are commonly used to understand biological data. And finally, the last application we'll talk about is medication and chemical discovery. Closely related to biological data, supervised learning can also help understand chemical data. As you can see, we've looked at quite a few applications of supervised learning. That's why this is such an exciting course because we're learning very relevant skills. Now that we've talked about applications, let's actually talk about what we're going to learn in this course. First off, we are going to talk about what is supervised learning. You'll get a whole overview of that shortly. Then we're going to build out beginner supervised neural networks. This course is beginner friendly. If you don't know anything about machine learning, you can still follow along because we'll be doing beginner projects for you. For example, we're going to build a neural network from scratch. And don't worry, we'll go over what a neural network is as well. And then we'll build a convolutional neural network from scratch. We'll be slowly building up our skills, starting simple and then getting more complicated. Following that project, we're going to build yet another project. It's going to be a series of building recurrent neural networks. We'll talk about what that type of neural network is when we get to it. We're going to build a project of a recurrent neural network as well as a dynamic recurrent neural network. As I mentioned, we'll be focusing heavily on computer vision in this course. Our projects are going to be to recognize images, but we'll also look at recognizing patterns in textual and digit data. And then finally, we're going to build a bi-directional recurrent neural network. This is a very hands-on practical course. You're going to learn just enough theory to get you through understanding the hands-on projects because we really want to emphasize doing instead of just theory. And that is what you are going to learn in this course. Next up, we are going to jump into what you need to know for the projects. I'll see you in that next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back to Mammoth Interactive's Complete Machine Learning Course 2.0. In this lecture we are overviewing what is supervised learning. Later on in this course we're going to build hands-on projects that involve supervised neural networks. But first we have to understand what is supervised learning in the first place. Supervised learning is a type of machine learning task. It learns a function that maps an input to an output. One example is classifying an image to see what's inside of that image. 
Supervised learning uses sample input-output pairs in order to train. That means that it's going to take sample images to learn how to recognize what is inside of an image. That's just one example of what supervised learning is good for. The supervised learning algorithm analyzes training data such as an image data set. It infers a function, meaning it's going to learn patterns about the images in order to classify. And we can use that function that the algorithm learns to determine classes of brand new data. That means our supervised learning machine learning model, it can take in brand new images that it's never seen before that are unlabeled and it can determine what's inside of that image. But first, in order to learn how to do that, it has to learn on labeled data. Supervised learning has a parallel task in psychology, in human and animal psychology known as concept learning. Concept learning is how we humans learn. It's just one type of learning. And it's a good metaphor for supervised learning. Let's break down concepts. A concept is a category of stimuli that have features in common. For example, you could say that the number nine is a concept. If an if a model is learning how to detect a number inside of an image, it has to know what a 9 looks like. It has to look at a 9 being drawn a bit slanted to the left, a bit slanted to the right, perhaps drawn perfectly straight, but it has to learn the features that make up a hand-drawn number 9. That is known as a category, the number 9, and it can do that with the number 0, the number 1, the number 2, if it's trying to recognize numbers in an image. It has to learn the common features of a number like number 9. Another example is if a model is recognizing shapes. It has to learn the common features that create a triangle. For example, if it had these three triangles depicted, the model could learn that triangles have three sides, three straight lines, and that they're a shade of red. Because in this sample data set of just three triangles, they're all shades of red. Triangles also have three angles, three corners, and these are all features that triangles have in common. The machine learning model has to learn the features that a category contains. For example, a number nine, if a machine learning model is detecting what number is in an image, a number nine will have a circular head and then a tail. Now the machine learning model analyzes the pixels of an image in order to learn features of the image. Let's talk more about concept learning because it's going to give you a good understanding of supervised learning. The two are parallel. Concept learning is a human's ability to apply knowledge across a variety of circumstances. For example, as a child, you might learn what a triangle is, and then you could learn to recognize triangles in other circumstances, such as in a recycling sign or in a ruler that has a triangular shape for calculating angles. So concept learning is learning features of something like a triangle and then applying those features to new circumstances, like seeing new shapes that resemble a triangle. Supervised machine learning follows the same pattern. It learns features and then it can apply those features that it's learned to a new circumstance. It can learn features of the number nine and then be able to detect those features in another image of a number nine. Concept learning comes from Gagne's hierarchy of learning. It's one type of learning. A simple type of learning is signal learning, kind of like Pavlov's dog, where the dog, an animal, responds to a certain signal by salivating. Another type of learning is stimulus response. This is a human or an animal responding to a stimulus. Another type of learning is chaining, where you can chain multiple stimuli as a response. 
A next type of learning, a bit more advanced, is verbal association, where you can recognize words. The next step of learning is discrimination learning, another type, where you learn to discriminate between different classes. Concept learning is specifically being able to group certain features and certain inputs into a class, such as recognizing numbers, shapes. And then we have more complex types of learning like principal learning and problem solving. Supervised machine learning, it is parallel to concept learning, one of the more advanced types of learning. Let's go back to talking about the supervised learning algorithm. There are several steps to building out a supervised learning algorithm. We're going to be exactly coding out all of these steps to build our own supervised learning algorithms later on in this course. But first, let's look at a bird's eye view of the steps. Step one is to determine the type of training examples that you're going to feed your algorithm. For example, if you're trying to train your algorithm to recognize how to read, how to read hand-drawn words, for example, well, you have to decide, are you going to train the model on handwritten characters, handwritten words, or handwritten sentences? You have to determine what you're going to train your algorithm on. That is step one. Step two is going to be to gather a training set. Perhaps you decide you're going to train your model on hand-drawn digits. So you are going to give it hand-drawn digit images to train it how to recognize digits. In that case, you then are going to gather a training set of hand-drawn digit images. The training set you choose should be representative of a real-world use of the algorithm. If I am training my algorithm to detect hand-drawn digits, then I don't want to give it something random like typed out digits. I want to give it hand-drawn digits because that's what I'm going to use the algorithm for. The next step in building a supervised learning algorithm, a supervised learning machine model, is to represent the input features. You want to represent your images. How you represent your images will affect the accuracy of your machine learning model. Let's talk about why. Well, you have to transform your input, such as your image, into a feature vector. Images are two-dimensional if they're grayscale and three-dimensional if they're colored because a, an image with colors is going to have red, green, and blue values, which means that the image is going to be not just two-dimensional, but actually three-dimensional. You don't just have the width and the height, you also have the three color values at every pixel in the width and the height. So first you are going to have to transform your input into a feature vector to effectively flatten the image. And this vector should choose features that are descriptive of the input. When you flatten an image, you're turning its representation two-dimensional or three-dimensional. You're taking the three-dimensional matrix, for example, and you're making it one-dimensional. Because a three-dimensional image, meaning an image with colors, it has a lot of features, a lot of data, and you want to narrow down the features to be only the ones that are most important. Otherwise, it's going to take a very long time to train your algorithm on all of this data. That's why you have to transform your input to a feature vector akin to flattening the image. But when you are selecting features for flattening, you have to make sure you don't lose important data from the image. Another factor that could lead to the decreasing of accuracy of your model is if you have a number of features that is too large. Because as I mentioned, that means that the model is going to take a very long time to train on all of these data points and it can be more complex. So you have to choose a number of features that's not too small but also not too large when you're flattening your images. The vector you create has to have enough information to accurately predict an output. You have to flatten your image in a way that the model can still recognize what, what is in the image, such as what digit is in the image, 
or what animal is in the image, what shape is in the image. That's just one example, detecting images. The next step of building a supervised learning model is to determine the structure of your learned function and algorithm. What kind of machine learning model will you choose? Are you choosing a decision tree, a neural network, or what? The type of machine learning model you choose depends on your problem as well as what you are trying to accomplish. There are many types of supervised learning models that you can choose from, like neural networks, support vector machines, decision trees, etc. And a lot of them can actually solve the same problem, but some are better than others, some are more efficient than others. So you have to sometimes use trial and error to decide which one is best for a problem. The next step that we are going to take for building our supervised learning models is to train our algorithm with a training set. This is where your model is going to learn from images. You give it labeled images such as this image has the number 9, this image has the number 8, and your model is going to learn how to map features to labels. It's going to learn, okay, these are the features common to all these number 9s. So I'm going to map those features to the label 9. These features seem to be common to the number 8, so I'm going to map those features to the number 8. It learns patterns. It learns what features are common to what labels. That is the training step. When you train, you're looping your algorithm on the images. And with every loop of an image, with every image you come to, you're going to adjust the parameters of your algorithm slightly. For example, say an algorithm has uh, the function weight times input plus bias. We're going to be looking more in depth into those equations later on. But say you have weight times input plus bias as your formula for training. Well, you're going to have to adjust the parameters, the weight and the bias you adjust the constants of your equation at every loop of training. And why are you adjusting parameters? You're adjusting parameters to get to eventually the most optimal equation possible. Because an algorithm is an equation, and so you're adjusting the parameters of your equation with every loop to get closer and closer to being more accurate at classifying, if you're performing a task of classifying. And the final step is going to be to evaluate the accuracy of your model. And you do this by running your model on a testing set. The algorithm, in this case, it gets just images and it has to decide what's in the image. Is the image a number 9? Is it a number 8? And then you can compare the model's prediction with an actual label for that image. That is where you are testing the algorithm's accuracy. We're going to be doing all of these steps programmatically coming up in this course. And that is supervised learning. Throughout this course we're going to build supervised learning neural networks together. We're going to see all of those steps in action programmatically. I'm very excited to take you into our first project of building our first neural network together with Python. Join me in the next lecture. Hello everyone and welcome back to Mammoth Interactive's Complete Machine Learning Course 2.0. In this lecture, I am going to show you how you can build machine learning models and run them, train them, test them, visualize them all on the web. That's right, you don't have to download or install any software for this course. Now you can if you'd like to. If you prefer to run your Python scripts via PyCharm, Visual Studio, Atom, you can run them using an integrated development environment, a program like that. For that you'd have to download and install that software. But there is a way to build models that are functional, working, and ready to use right on the web without any installation or downloading. For that, just visit the website colab.research.google.com. This is going to take you to 
a website known as Google Colab, short for Google Collaboratory. You can log in with your Gmail account and you'll be taken to Google Colab. It's kind of like Google Docs for coding. Any code that you write in Google Colab, you can execute right here in Google Colab. The default is Python, but you can extend it to other languages. For example, if I type print hello, this is a Python print statement printing out the string hello. All I have to do is run the code cell by clicking this run button and it's going to execute any code in the cell. The first time it runs, it has to connect, so it's going to take a bit of time, a few seconds, but for any subsequent cells, it'll run faster. And look at that, I got the string hello being printed. This means that my Python code was executed as a Python script. Typically, you would do this in a piece of software like PyCharm, but Google Colab makes it very easy to run Python scripts. Here in Google Colab, you can also just add text if you want to add hints, and you can format the text as well. If you'd like to, you can go to File, and you can upload a notebook. With this course, we're going to provide all the source code for each lecture. You can find it at the end of every section. You can upload your own notebooks. They just have to be a .ipynb, which means a Jupyter notebook type. And if you upload a notebook here, you can run its code cells. You can save a copy of the notebook to your Google Drive or download the Jupyter notebook file or the Python file if you want to save it as a Python script. A Jupyter notebook file is a Python file that you can run on Google Colab or on Jupyter notebook. Some more things you can do with Google Colab here is you can edit cells with this edit tab, you can view a table of contents and more, you can insert code cells, text cells, section header cells and more. You can run all the code cells at once with this run all button. That is a useful button because if you close the notebook and you reopen it again, you'll have to run all the code cells again. Because with Google Colab, if I make a cell like I declare a variable called dog and I set it to equal scruffy, if I don't run this code cell and then I start a new code cell and I try to print dog, I'm going to get an error saying that the dog variable was never declared. So you want to make sure you run every code cell if it's important to the current one. There we go. More you can do is you can interrupt execution, you can restart the runtime, you can add an accelerator, a GPU to make your code run faster. You can also manage all of your sessions to delete them if you want to stop a session from being run. And you can access some settings if you want to set preferences. Google Colab is quite a useful tool. You can share your Colab files with anyone you're working with. So this is what we are going to use to build our machine learning models together. We're using Google Colab so that way you don't have to have any system requirements. This course will be compatible on Mac, Windows, Linux. Let's go ahead and jump into our first project now that we know how we're going to build out our Python files and our algorithms. Let's jump into our first project. I'll see you in the next lecture. Hey everyone, thanks for watching this course. If you want to watch the rest of the course, the link is down below. Not only will you get the access to this course, but you'll get access to a lot of other courses in a huge bundle. And it's on sale today. So buy it before the sale ends. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in another video.